So in this session, we are going to talk about attribute rules in Arcade. And my name is Seng Ho Kim. I am a software developer in GeoDatabase team for now 12 years. And then I mostly working on these network problems like geometry network and utility network. And last year and this year, I got involved in designing and implementing this attribute rule framework. And my coworker, Hussein, could you introduce? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sanho. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. My name is Hussein. I'm from the GeoDatabase team. Uh, I've been working with the ArcGIS product uh, since 2005. I recently joined Esri, I think, in 2015, and, uh, as a, and especially started with the utility network project, and then we recently uh, jumped into the product owner to build the attribute rules, and uh, the, this is the cool thing we're going to show you today. Attribute rules is a, is a concept that is in the Geo database. It's gonna ha we're going to have so much fun, guys. Okay. Okay, this is a today's agenda. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, mostly consists of the three parts. It's, we are, we'll go over the general overview of the attribute rules with certain details of the certain attribute rule types. And second part, we will go over the validation service in details. And then we are going to talk about the dictionary as return type. And at the end of the talk, we will show some SDK and other sample code, as well as we are summarizing and then what's coming in the future release. And if you please turn off the cell phone and please hold the questions at the end. So we will have enough time for the Q&A session. So. This is the overview of attribute rules. Uh, I think you are pretty familiar with the subtype and domain concept of the geodatabase. If you have a table attribute, if you specify the domains, you can constrain the edits that's coming into the attributes. We are extending those capabilities using this attribute rule framework. And this is an evolving technology across the whole ArcGIS platform and we are providing the validation service <clears throat> as a service-based architecture. And in the current release, we only support these attribute rules for enterprise geodatabase. But in the near future, we will support file geodatabase as well as mobile, which is SQLite. And this the attribute rule itself is based on the Ar arcade language. And as the language evolves, the power of attribute rules keep getting extended together. Attribute rules are defined, <clears throat> no, no, rules are just to enhance the editing experience as well as to improve the data integrity. So we can use attribute rules to automatically populate other attribute, or we can constrain invalid edits like the domain or subtype usage, and we can perform the QA style check against the existing data set. Those are three main usage of these attribute rules. And attribute rules are defined in a feature class or tables in a geodatabase, and it's utilizing the arcade language. So as the, the ownership is uh, on the data set itself, if we delete the table or feature class, the rules are gone together. And we provide two ways of managing the attribute rules. First one is attribute rule view, which is shown on the right side. And another is a, a bunch of the GP tools. In both ways, you can manage the attribute rules. You can create, delete, enable, disable, or even import, export those rules. And you can access this view through the, by right-clicking the data set. And it has a design menu. And it's subtype. It has sub-menu. It's called the attribute rules. And the, this ribbon and views will be popping up. And as you see in the, each rule, it has certain properties. It rule has name, description, and subtype that this rule will be, will be applicable to, and field and the expression itself. And as I said, the attribute rule is based on this arcade expression. It's a scripting language. I, I believe you are 
pretty familiar with this language. And this is very easy to use. The grammar is very similar to JavaScript and has a rich library of functions. As you see in the code example, it's very similar to JavaScript. And we provide a bunch of functions like the geometry, intersect operation, and so on. And the sec I missed the second bullet. The, it, this arcade expression from the rules perspective, it's one of the properties, just a plain text. Too but it's owned by the rules. And this is an important slide. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are gonna talk about the rule types. We can classify attribute rules by when those rules are evaluated. If it's evaluated at the edit operation, which means if you create a feature, update the existing feature or delete, we trigger these two rule types. They are called immediate calculation rules or constraint rules. The, the purpose of the immediate calculation rule is just to populate other attributes. As such, the, the return type from the script expression should be any value that, that's compatible with the target field. And as you see in the example, <coughs> we are adding this field one plus field two. If both are integer, it'll be the another integer value. Then you can write that a result to the target field. Another immediate style rule is the constraint rule. The purpose is just to specify permissible values like a domain. So the script should return true false, like the field one should be less than field two. Another two rule types is they are evaluated by validation service. They are called batch calculation rule and validation rule. The batch calculation rule is essentially very similar to immediate calculation, but these are evaluated in a batch mode. A bunch of the rules are evaluated together. And it similarly should return any type. And then the script example is saying, the last one is a validation rule. It's just counterpart of the constraint rule, but it's also evaluated in a batch mode. So the purpose is just to evaluate the existing data. <laughs> okay, this slide is, we are going over the details of the immediate calculation rules. We are using these immediate calculation rules to automatically populate other attributes. And the second bullet is saying the execution type is batch unchecked. On the right side screenshot bottom, there's orange box. The batch checkbox should be unchecked to make this calculation rule kind of immediate calculation rules. And you have to specify the target field that the evaluation result is written to and you can make those target fields editable or uneditable. Uneditable means that only this rule can write the value to the field. And it's evaluated during the edit operation, insert, update, or delete. And you, you have to specify the order between the other immediate calculation rules. It's an important concept. So this slide is highlighting that the Old calculation order matters. So let's say we have this the simple table with uh, three attributes, field one, two, three, and they have value one, two, three. And there is a rule one, it's saying that we are adding the field two plus field three and assigning it to the field one. The second rule is saying, oh, just assigning field value one field one's value to the field three. If you calculate this order, rule one first and rule two second, we see that the final result is five to five because two plus three is five, it's assigning to field one and we don't touch the field two and field three is just assigning the field one value, so five to five. But if we evaluate in the opposite order, the final result will be pretty different. Can you guess the result? <laughs> yeah, quizzing you guys. Come on. 
<laughs> Correct. <laughs> No, three, two, one. Three, two, one. <laughs> yeah. Just we are evaluating rule two first. Just we assign value one to the field three, and then now field three is one plus field two value is two, so field one's value becomes three. So, so I just I want to highlight that this order matters when you calculate. It. Yeah, and this is the details of the constraint rules. It's specifying the permissible attribute configurations. So we just want to make sure that the spec certain specific conditions are met on the feature. And as, as I said, the arcade expression should return true false type value. It's evaluated by the edit operations. What happens we, if this rule is violated? then our system triggers the, raises the errors with the user-defined error number and messages. It's part of the rule definition. And then we roll back the edits. If it's, we are, user is attempt to create certain feature, we just roll it back. You cannot create. So that's how we block the, the edits. So Hussein will demonstrate the immediate calculation and constraint rules. Okay. When you're doing like say you're doing an insert operation and you're doing like two or three or four records, does it involve or does the, the rule um, execute when you apply those edits or does it happen when you create like a new row? Yeah, okay. That, what what does insert when does insert happen? Okay. Let me go back to the previous slide. So the question is when we create feature one, two, three, when these rules are invoked or triggered, the answer is for each insert, we just trigger these rules. If it has the constraint rule, we just block there before creating two or three. So each individual edit operation, we just trigger this. So it could be heavy in certain situations. All right, let's okay. uh, switch to number three. All right, guys, so uh, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, very sample data, and uh, I am currently an editor, and uh, I'm responsible for managing Landmark in my city, which is uh, Southern California, San Diego specifically. And uh, what we're gonna show you here is like the different attribute rules uh, that which is the constraint rule, immediate rule, and then we'll go through all of them. So what I have here as an editor, I have uh, a map configured with attribute rules, and uh, what I have here is the city feature class, uh, which has basically the cities, and there is a field called the name of the uh, of the city, essentially, like for example, Poway, and we have a school feature, and we have a liquor store feature class, so three feature class. So the first attribute rules that we're gonna explain here is the constraint attribute rule, which, which Sanho explained. These rules are assigned at the feature class level to prevent you from making edits that doesn't satisfy your arcade expression, okay? So let's go ahead and show you what I have configured as a constraint rule on my school. So you, there are multiple ways to view the attribute rules. You can right to click, go to design, and then you can click on attribute rules, okay? So this is one way of doing it. Another way, ooh, I zoned in very far there. Another way is you can go through the ribbon and then you can click this. So both way will lead you to the attribute rules. And if you click on constraint here, which is the way we're interested in, we have a rule here that says school must have a type. Okay, and this is a field that we have which is called the school type. And I have a very simple rule that says, hey, if, if you have not per, uh, put a school type, uh, if you have not provided a school uh, type like a public school or charter, then fail the edit, else make the edit uh, successful. Okay, so let's show you the actual uh, attribute rule in a better environment so it's a clear, so this is, 
this is a sample of a constraint attribute rule that is assigned to this school feature class. And what it happens is, the first thing we see is this dollar sign feature, and this is what we call an arcade global. And this is the current context of the feature that is being edited currently, okay? So in this case, this is the school that I just created. I receive the feature, right? And then I, I can check it, right? So I can check. In this case, I'm using the domain name function in Arcade to check the school type. If it's unknown, then go ahead and return false, which indica indicates to the attribute rule system that do not let this edit to go in. Please fail this edit, okay? So otherwise, if it's anything else, go ahead and return true, okay? So let's go ahead and show you how this actually works. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and zoom into Carlsbad, and uh, I go all here area, and then I'm gonna create a school feature, and then I am deliberately gonna leave the school type unknown, okay, and if I create a feature, you're gonna get this error, which is good error, you wanna see this error. For once, this is an error that you actually wanna see. This is an error that you have put, this is bad data, you don't want data, bad data to go in, okay? So as you can see, this has a kind of a reactive way. It's like, the moment I edit, execute and fail, okay? So there is another type of rules that says, okay, you know what, let the edit go and tell me later that something is wrong with my data, which is called the validation rules. We're gonna talk about all that, okay? So if I put an, a value here, let's say boarding school, and I create that feature, you can see that the feature is created, okay? So let's go ahead and show you the other type of rules here, and I, I don't know if you had noticed, there is a city field in the school, and what we wanna do is use immediate calculation to calculate the city by actually intersecting with the city polygon, pull the name and store it in the city field in the school feature class, okay? How can I do that? Obviously, we're gonna right click, design, attribute rules, right? And then we're gonna show you the calculation rule. There's a one calculation that says, hey, give the name of the city for the school. And this is the script that does that. But let me show you the script in a better environment. As you can see, this script uh, execute on insert update and delete. I forgot to show you this triggers, right? So because of the constraint rule, the same thing, right? It, it actually executes on insert and update. When I create a new school or update a school, go ahead and execute this, essentially, the, the, that rule. Okay, so calculation rule. Let's go ahead and show you the, the script in a better environment so you can clearly see it. Okay, hopefully you can see the code. But what we see here is similarly, right? So this rule is being added to the school again. So dollar sign feature is the school. That's nice, okay. But now we are seeing a new thing. What is feature set by name? And uh, if you saw the preliminary pre pre today is actually they, they showed this uh, uh, function, arcade script, which you can use to create kind of a cursor to another feature class. In my case, I am going to open the city feature class, and I am only interested in the name of the city, right? There are, might be a lot of other fields in the city feature class. I am only interested in the name. You, wa you wanna do this for performance reason, right? So you will open this feature set by name, and you will see another global here, which is dollar data store. This is another arcade global, which tells you the workspace of uh, the current execution. So you can essentially execute the entire workspace, access the, the whatever data you have in this workspace, okay? We got the city feature class, go ahead and intersect with the dollar sign feature, which is the school that I just created, okay? Now I have the geometry, intersect with the city, I'm gonna get another cursor, which uh, essentially will be, if you're lucky, you're gonna always get one city, obviously you're gonna create in one city, right? So go ahead and give me the first city. Then if it's now return empty, else return name. And what will happen here is if I return the name, it will be stored in the city field of the school. Okay, so let's show you a demo. How can I do this? So if I create another school here, we forgot to pick the public, that constraint rule, that's good. <laughs> so, so if I populate then I go to attribute, you can see that 
Carlsbad has been assigned because I created the city and uh, the school in Carlsbad. But if I go to Encinitas and I create the feature here, you can see the city has been populated as Encinitas. Okay, so pretty cool stuff. So that's uh, in a nutshell the constraint rule, immediate calculation rule. Just just pay attention that they are executed when you create your feature, update your feature, or delete. So they are uh, they are executed while you're editing. Okay. And another very important thing is the calculation rules execute first, and the final thing is the constraint rule. And the reason is because you might have done a lot of calculation, change the state of the feature, and the finally the constraint rule says will take the final result and fail if necessary. It doesn't execute first. We first execute all the calculation rules and then finally fire up the constraint rule. With that said, let's jump back to Sano. Okay. Yeah, I missed that. It's yeah, that's, important topic. that's a very yeah. important topic. The constraint rule is the gatekeeper before you are writing to the data. Yes, even the validation rules are the gatekeepers, yeah. Right. When we come to batch calculation. Right. We'll go there. Okay, the Hussein nicely demonstrates those immediate calculation and constraint rule types. Uh, we released this immediate calculation and constraint rules with PRO 2.1 time frame. And this time we are introducing another big stuff for validation service, which will be released with the PRO 2.3 time frame with server 10 seconds. <clears throat> the main job of this validation service is just to evaluate batch calculation and validation rules. And this validation ser service is useful for the following three use cases. When you already have an existing data set, but you want to check a lot of things against those existing data set, then you can configure the rules and then run the validation service. For example, you bulk unloading the raw data, but you don't want to check in every details when the rows are inserted. Instead, you bulk unloading and evaluate all at once later. Another useful case is, um, you want to evaluate data set at a specified time. So you can, during the daytime, you can let the editors edit their data freely without the overhead of this immediate or constraint rules. And at midnight, the admin users, they can run the validation service and validate everything at once. The third case is the script itself might be pretty heavy, just too expensive to evaluate and then you can utilize these batch calculation rules. This is showing the workflow of the validation service. When you add a batch calculation or, or validation rule to a data set, our system is establishing the schema required for the validation service. The schema means that we are adding certain uh, system maintained attribute as well as some system maintained tables. Those are error tables actually. And you share the data set as a web feature layer. When you share, the validation capability should be enabled. Uh, okay, after this publishing process, you can add those web feature layer to the map and you start editing. And then you can evaluate the rules and checking features using this error inspector, the bottom screenshots. And you identify certain errors and you fix well, what's wrong with these errors and then you reevaluate these error features will be gone after. Okay, in, in the previous slide I mentioned that we established the required schema. This is about those details. We are adding the, the System main attribute, it's called validation status. It, it's basically representing the, the status of the, the feature. The, does this feature require calculation or does this feature require validation? Or does this feature have any related errors? It's showing these three informations. Another things we are laying down is the error tables. Depending on the geometry types, we are laying down these four different error tables, point line, polygon, and object errors. Yeah. 
And we can trigger the evaluate operation through uh, four different mechanisms. First, you can open the error inspector, it's a UI, and you click the evaluate rule button. Or you can run the GP tool, it's called evaluate rules. <laughs> or you can directly open up the, the server manager and there's a evaluate operation, you can invoke that way. Or you can invoke through the SDK. What these four things are essentially do is just sending this URL to the server. And then the validation service is getting this URL with a bunch of the parameters and it's running all its validation process, interacting with database and returning the result back to the client. Okay, this is the validation status changes. When you create a feature or, or update existing features, you see that this calculation required or validation required, it gets checked, which means those feature becomes dirty. It needs a calculation, it needs the validation. But currently it doesn't have any error. If you invoke these evaluate operations, those two first two parameters get reset. It becomes a clean feature and depending on the evaluation result, it may or may not have errors. And once you touch the edit the errors again, then it becomes a dirty feature again. And this is the lifespan of the error features. Actually, it's very similar to the geodatabase topology model. We create an error feature the, when the validation rule is violated or a batch calculation rule failed while evaluating. The second case is not that use, usual, but let's say the script has divide by zero kind of operation, then it may fail. Then we can register error feature. So the right top box, we are showing the example. The rule is the field one should be less than 10. However, the field one's value is now one. After evaluating, it generates an error feature, the just red text. Then how do we clean up this error feature? The common use case is the first one. Just fix the source, source feature. Now we field one's value, we type in 11, then it satisfies the validation rule. Then <clears throat> after evaluating, this error feature will be cleaned up. Another use case is we just delete the source or we delete the relevant rules and then those relevant errors are gone together. So Hussein will demonstrate the validation thank service. You can switch to three. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sanho. So uh, we have talked about the immediate calculation rule. We have talked about constraint rule and we say that these are executed after an edit. So I make an edit these get executed. But these two types that Sano is talking about is kind of an on-demand evaluation of attribute rules. We call them on-demand attribute rules. Batch calculation is one of them. Validation is another, okay? The validation rule is another one. So, so that means since it's on-demand, I need some sort of a state in my feature to tell me if this feature requiring evaluation or not. Otherwise, I'll be evaluating the same feature over and over and over again, right? So I need to, to tell the system, hey, this feature is actually clean, leave it alone, right? Or this feature requiring an evaluation, please go ahead and clean it up, okay? And this is the validation status that uh, Sanho talked about, right? So which is like, it tells you, hey, this feature requiring calculation, or this feature requiring validation, or this is a clean, okay? And this this is the colors that have been seen. I don't know if you have noticed, there's purple and green. And if you see purple, that means this feature is dirty, it is requiring evaluation. If it's green, that means it's, it's clean, it has been evaluated. So that's what the colors mean, essentially, okay? So with that said, let's talk about the batch calculation rule first, okay? So I have a batch calculation rule now on my city feature class, and what it does is, it actually does a very interesting thing. It calculates the number of schools that is in the city and stores it in the school count. It's a very simple arcade script that actually literally take the feature, intersect, 
find the count of schools, store it in the school count. So whenever we evaluate a city, we're gonna calculate this number. And what will happen is we'll also, I'll just label this uh, for you guys. So the number is actually the number of schools, right? So, and uh, there is also the field, which you can see, the school count, all right? So let's go ahead and show you the script, what it's actually doing. So that's the batch calculation rule. What it does here is, essentially, this batch calculation rule is assigned to the city feature class, right? So that means dollar sign feature is the city feature that is currently being evaluated. So keep that in mind. So what I do, first thing, create a cursor, feature set by name, give me the, in the workspace, give me the school feature class. And I'm really just interested in the object ID because I just want to count. I don't, and I don't want any other attributes, right? So make, make sure to populate this third parameter, otherwise it's gonna pull everything, okay? And you don't want that, okay? You want, you want to actually, just like a just general geodatabase practice. I have the school feature set. I'm gonna go ahead and intersect with this feature, which is the polygon, the city polygon, with the feature class. Give me all the schools, return the count, which is an arcade function, how many, uh, how many schools in that, and then store that in the schools feature class, right? So where is it? Yeah. Uh, store that in the school count field in the city, okay? Let's show how this works. So in order to do that, we need obviously to publish this and enable the validation service that Sanho have done. I have already done that, okay? And uh, so I have my, my feature class already enabled with the validation service. I can use the error inspector, that is some few my familiar with, to actually do the evaluation. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna evaluate the current extent which has the, literally the city, cars bad, and then it's gonna calculate how many schools, and it's updated now, and as you can see, once we evaluate, it turns back to green, which means it is no longer requiring evaluation. But wait a second, the moment I add a brand new school, okay, it's gonna turn back into requiring calculation, requiring calculation, and the reason is, we're gonna explain that in the third section of the demo, which is we have kinda of marked the city as requiring calculation from this edit. We're gonna talk about that. So I added a new school, this says still six, and that's okay because our rule is in batch mode, it's on demand. Someone has to go and click this in order to evaluate this. And you can see the number jump to seven and so on, right? So that's the batch calculation rule. We use it on demand to populate the, the certain fields with, um, uh, especially if you have a complex arcade script. You wanna run them on demand. You don't want to stuck this complex arcade script on an edit because remember, if you put it as an immediate calculation or constraint, it's gonna execute after every edit, so it's gonna slow down your editing. So you really, really need to be careful what rules you put as immediate calculation constraint and what rules you put as batch, right? It's all, it's all a trade-off. Let's talk about validation rule. Validation rule here, I have a validation rule actually on the school feature class, and that rule says, hey, a school cannot be within a mile of any liquor store, okay? So let's take a look at this validation rule. So go ahead and click, yup, that's wrong. <laughs> All right, oops, I did it again. So design attribute rules, okay, and I'm gonna click on the validation here. And then I have the validation rule, which is schools uh, cannot be within a mile of any liquor store, right? And Obviously, it's an assignment on all subtypes, and this is the errors and all this information. So let's take a look at the actual arcade script in a, in a better editor. So it's, okay, all right. So what we have here is, again, we're evaluating the school, so dollar sign feature naturally becomes the school, correct? So what we do here is take the school, do a buffer, which is an arcade function, a mile, this creates a polygon, a circle. Take that circle and intersect it with the uh, liquor store feature class, which is the cursor that we created. And then once you get intersected, get the count, right? It's much more performant this way. You get the count. If you find no liquor stores, then return true. That means this school is okay. There is no errors. 
Okay, otherwise return false, which forces a creating an error. So what does that mean, right? School is a point feature class. So where do we put the error, really, right? We can't put it in the same feature class. That's why we go back to the four feature classes that Seno talked about, point, line, uh, polygon, and object uh, class, right? So this error goes to the point error feature class, okay? So let's show you guys a demo. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in here, and I'm going to uh, deliberately create a liquor store next to these schools, and then what we're gonna do is run evaluate, okay? And then when I run evaluate, as you can see, what happened here is I got an error, this red thing. Can I select it? I cannot select it. So let's see if I can make it bigger. So what, 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 what this error actually, it's actually got selected, right? Yep, it got, just yellow. So this is the error we got. We got schools cannot be within a mile from the liquor store, and this is a point error, which you can see it here as well, right? So that's a point error. This is one way you can see it. You can select it, interact with it, okay? You can also see it on the error inspector. You can view all the errors, okay? And so you can see this school is an error, this school is an error, this also, this school also has been marked as an error. And final thing, if I want to fix this, obviously one way is to delete the liquor store or move it away. And then if I uh, evaluate again, what will happen is it will go away. And I hope you were paying attention to the colors of this purple and green. The state is changing as I edit and I deliberately made this to change, right? So some, some of the state changes are taken care by the system. Like if you edit a feature, it immediately becomes dirty which uh, let, let's show you, for example, if I edit anything here, like this school, it's green now, if I change it to charter, it will immediately become purple, which means it has been edited, right? Which the validation status field changes, essentially, it says validation required, okay? And there are things that the system doesn't do because it doesn't know, like if you created a feature in one feature class, Sometimes you're responsible to mark other features at a quine calculation based if they are have a relation like this one, right? And we're gonna talk about this in the next demo. Back to you, Sano. Okay. I noticed that your script as liquor store became the bar. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you did notice that. I so we are going to briefly talk about the, the dictionary as a return type. In an arcade language, dictionary is just a key value pairs. It's essentially, in a programming world, it's a just hash function kind of thing. So we reserved certain keyword for specific purposes. Uh, those keywords are results, calculation required, validation required. And the last one is error message. The, the purpose of the keyword result is that when you return the value through this dictionary, you can use this keyword. And second one is calculation validation required keywords. When you mark other features as calculation validation required, then you can use this specific grammar. You have to specify the class name and the object that you want to mark those features dirty way. <clears throat> <laughs> and the last one is error message. So you can specify your own error message from the script itself. And error message should be a standalone inside the dictionary, but the result and other keyword can be combined within the same dictionary. Then Hussein will go over the Show the demo. Sure. Thank you. All right, so dictionaries. So uh, I want to talk about this concept, uh, but before we jump into that, I want to show you the guys that this concept is is actually very very cool, right? And 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 let's go back and ask you guys a question. Think of it this way: If I now uh, back to my school, I want to create 
uh, I want to create a rule that says if the city, if the school that I'm creating is outside the city, let's say someone is creating in the middle of the ocean, right? How do you prevent that? We learned that, right? It's a constraint rule. Very simple, right? You can do a constraint rule, intersect with the city. If there is no city, uh, fail, right? So what the dictionaries allow you to do, which is you can only do this with 2, 3, and 10, 7, is you can actually, part of the calculation rule, make it act as a constraint rule, which is a very powerful thing. So you already have this rule that calculates the city in the school, right? We have, uh, uh, we'll, we'll basically look up the city, get the name, and then populate the city value, right? Which is the city name. But you can, if you decide, instead of just returning the original script, where we only return an empty string, we can actually make it return this polygon, uh, this polygon, <laughs> this JSON, which is a special JSON that Sanho looks up and says, hey, if you say return a dictionary, which is a JSON file with error message, then the calculation rule will actually fail. And if this is part of the validation rule, the validation rule will throw an error, actually, okay? So you can actually return this and then fail the calculation rule. If there is a city, then we're gonna go ahead and return the city name. Okay, but what is this dictionary object? Now, we're gonna talk about this, All right? So now that I am just created a new school in my city, I have to let the city by, to know that, hey, something has changed. We just added a couple of new schools. You have a batch calculation rule. You need to reevaluate yourself. And we do that by using this dictionary. We literally return a dictionary saying, hey, this is the result. So as usual, business as usual, return the city name, store it in my school city field. But also, by the way, these features, I want them to mark, mark them as requiring calculation, make them requiring re-evaluation, tell people that something has changed, okay? And that is why, guys, when we evaluate, and we, I create a new school, magically what happens is there's a failure, and magically what happens is the city becomes requiring calculation. Have you noticed this? Because that's, that's essentially the result of this particular rule. And the reason is you as an author of the script, you have to do this. Otherwise, you will add a bunch of schools and then you evaluate. The city is, is clean. Nobody, nobody, nobody touched it. So you know, nothing will happen until someone actually mar touches the city feature, like updated or something, and then we're going to... Uh, basically mark it as requiring calculation, and that will essentially do that work, okay? Another thing uh, uh, I wanna talk about is what we, what we have done here is if we, if we create a new feature, we are marking this city as requiring calculation, as you can see, right? But uh, what happens is that as you evaluate, you can actually clean this up and then uh, calculate the number of the new number of cities essentially right so that's the, that's essentially what I want to talk about here and uh, let's see what else what, what else can we talk about okay that's another rule that I created which is similarly if you have the school liquor store rule right so I want to know that if I am creating a new liquor store, I want to mark all the nearby schools as requiring calculation, telling, hey guys, something just happened in your area, reevaluate yourself, okay? And that's, that's what happened here, right? If I evaluate again, it becomes clean. If I delete it, it becomes dirty again, and then, and so on, right? So maybe I, if I zoom in here, you can see, so take a look at the school. If I create that, it just changes to purple. That means uh, that rule has just got fired up and then uh, it marked the city, the school as requiring calculation. All right, and uh, yeah, uh, the final thing we can do is talk about, we can go back to SDKs and sample. Send home. Okay. Okay, the remaining slide, we wanna talk about, briefly talk about SDK and some other sample code. 
So this slide is defining what we can or cannot do with the SDK. You can evaluate and inspect update errors by the SDK, but you cannot do kind of manage attribute rules by the SDK. We call it the DDL operation, it's a data definition language type. We don't support such thing through the SDK. And there's no explicit SDK support for constraint and immediate calculation rules because they are just automatically triggered behind the scene. And this is showing the general workflow how you write the SDK code. You get the attribute rule manager from the geodatabase and the geodatabase manager has a evaluate operation as well as some other APIs that you can fetch error features and related source features, as well as you can mark other errors as an exception. So this two code example, it's showing how we call evaluate. The, the above one is via the SDK. The bottom one is the JavaScript example. They are doing very similar things. You define the geodatabase from the connection and the define the attribute rule manager from the geodatabase object. And you can call this evaluate API with a bunch of other parameters. And you can do the similar thing with the JavaScript. You wanna add? Okay. And from uh, Pro 2.2, we started supporting this database sequence, so you can utilize the database sequence inside the script. You have to define the database sequence through the GP tool, it's called create database sequence or something, with the name on it, and then you can utilize it inside the script. Another example, uh, Hussein already covered many times of, about this feature set by name, so I wanna skip this script example. Okay, this is the wrapping up of today's talk. The attribute rule is to enhance the editing experience or improve the data integrity. We, we already started supporting this immediate calculation and constraint rule types. And with 2.3 time frame, we start supporting this validation service. And there are some future items we wanna <clears throat> support in, in the near future. So we will support the file geodatabase as well as mobile geodatabase for attribute rules. And we are talking about some DML, data manipulation language style support. You yeah. can create, update, delete features through this arcade script. And another thing is copy and paste in the current system if you copy the table to another, another there, then we don't copy those things. You have to export attribute rules and import it there. But we wanna naturally support this copy and paste thing like other subtype or domain things. And we have to support the handle exceptions of the errors. Okay, this is the end of the talk. Yeah, I wanna add one more thing for the support DML. And uh, I don't know if you guys noticed like this, this rule that I had, which calculates the total number of schools, it's like some of you was like, why is he not updating the city when, I, when he adds a new school? Just go and update the city feature, right? But we don't have that support yet. We cannot touch other features, editing them, when we are evaluating one single rule, right? Currently, if you have noticed, all, if I am evaluating an immediate calculation rule, all I can do is actually change myself. And that's it, okay, I cannot touch other features, right? I can read from them using the feature set by name, read pretty much, I do a lot of stuff, but if I wanna edit other features, that will be the DML support, which is data modification uh, manipulation language, where we can add in the future, like if I create a new school, I won't go and update the total number of schools in the cities, I can, I can do that, I don't need to do this all this batch calculation stuff. I, I should, I should, I, I can just leave that alone, right? Another thing I can just uh, uh, insert, delete other features as a result of this evaluation process. Okay, and uh, well, manage exceptions, 
these errors that you are seeing, right, as a result, uh, we can, we will need better management with them, like uh, mark them as exceptions and say, hey, this is an error I know, but uh, leave it alone, all right? It's like, uh, yes, I know this is an error, but I want you to not treat it as an error, as an exception. And uh, we're, we're working to, to maintain that right now, all right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And this is the resources screen, so. Yeah, you know more details about the attribute rule. Yeah, yeah. Check out check out the uh, blogs. We have a lot of blogs, a couple of blogs, I think, more than that, and uh, about the attribute rules, right? And then how we can create attribute rules, how we manage them, and uh, what's new and all that kind of stuff. Check out the arcade sessions. Again, what what I want to emphasize here is that any attribute rule that you write is part of the geo database. What does that mean? It means whatever the geo database goes you will execute these rules with. That means whatever you publish that, if you are in runtime, if you are in collector, if you are in, uh, in the web, if you're everywhere, these attribute rules will get fired as a result, okay? Especially it's like because everything just pours in into the eventually this feature service, like, all right? And uh, we're, we're working uh, to bring support and uh, for uh, attribute rules in runtime for offline, right? That's, so that's, it uh, will be hopefully coming in the near term plan. And yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. This is the first time we are offering this session. So yes. any feedbacks or comment would be welcomed. Yeah. So we have 10 more minutes, so we can have Yeah, we're going to open up for questions. If you want to see something and uh, have any questions, we'll. So, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, very interesting. <clears throat> what if uh, I use uh, Arceus Pro on my uh, Geo database, and then a little later, someone else in the office Still using desktop? Will it affect? Will it work? Or uh, can uh, can you repeat that question? So you yeah. you are you have ArcGIS Pro and then you have ArcMap desktop? Is that what yes. you? Yes. So Arc, uh, uh, attribute rule is not supported on ArcMap. So so what happens if if someone uses ArcGIS Pro and then another one a little later opens my my data? In, in Arceus desktop. So you're talking about a, a geo database that has attribute rules, and then you try to open it from ArcMap, it won't be open, correct? Yeah, it will, it will not, you cannot open this data. Once you add an attribute rules, it will basically, we're gonna upgrade the data set and becomes unreadable in ArcMap. Mm -hmm. That's right, Erling? Yes. Okay, There's thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So there is a minimum release on the geo database that will be pumped up, and the only release that can talk to uh, directly to the to this geo database is Pro and server, obviously, and certain clients. Essentially, that is are smart enough to execute attribute rules. Go ahead. Okay. So how about um, the SDKs, like or not the SDKs, but the other libraries like Python or or the Pro SDK? When you're actually writing code, like say you're in a insert cursor in Python. Yeah. How do attribute rules work with, with things So, like good that? question. Again, since uh, since Python and uh, SDK eventually talk to the Geo database, if you have immediate attribute rules, they will immediately get executed because this is a Geo database behavior, right? So, if you insert through Python, you'll get fired. If you if you violate a constraint rule, you'll you'll fail the edit normally. If you want to use an SDK, the validation service, you can. We have an evaluate method in the SDK, in the pro SDK. You can call evaluate method. If you don't have, like JavaScript doesn't have an SDK for evaluate, but you can, can you switch to three so I can show them? Yeah. Yeah, so JavaScript, for example, doesn't have the, the evaluate method, right? But if you even edit feature through, uh, like, uh, the, the viewer, like the ArcGIS viewer, you try to edit feature, it will eventually go to the feature service, and th that, that behavior will get executed on the server, right? Also, you can execute validation and calculation rules using this, just REST endpoint. We're going to call the REST endpoint using the Fetch API, which is a built-in uh, Capability in the web standard, you, you can find it in Chrome right now. If you do fetch, you'll find it. So this is not an ArcGIS thing. So you can fetch and then 
call that REST endpoint with the correct information, and then you will be able to evaluate. So yes, you answer your question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So with like the Pro SDK and Python, yeah. um, you have the idea of an edit session where you can do you know, 10,000 operations and then submit that. Mm -hmm. So that kind of tied back to my first question, was yes. like, when does an insert actually happen? So if you were to okay. do like a, an insert cursor in an edit session and you did the things, would it mm -hmm. fail as soon as you did the thing or as soon as you save it? Okay, so are you, your question is like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm editing you through SDK, I'm like creating features and then uh, finally, I'm re calling dot store basically, like committing my edits. Right? The question is, do I fire the attribute rules on every edit or finally on store? I mean, you can answer this question. Right? I got that. <laughs> <laughs> on store, right? On store. I would on, on store with triggering those yeah. attribute rules. So then you would end up with like. Ro roll back everything. Uh, well, yes, yeah, hundred percent. Yes. So on store, we finally are starting to flush. We try to flush these edits, and that was when we will start evaluating these edits. And then if they are not, then all your edits goes away essentially. So everything rolls back. Rolls back. Yeah. yeah. Based on the database transaction, it's a basically an asset system. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. So it's a couple of quick ones. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is there any scope to actually break the triggers for update to update geometry, update attributes, just to obviously for server processing, you know, to save them that. Uh, can you repeat it? I'm sorry. So, um, so within the updates, obviously, because if you update geometry up at the feature geometry, it's yes. going to affect certain rules, but if you yes. update the attributes, it's going to affect other rules. Is there any scope to actually break those to update geometry and update attributes rather than just having update? Because if you update an attribute, obviously it's going to be calling the ones that, let's say, for instance, the schools would actually go along and actually recheck if the geometry has changed when it happened. So, so what happens? So, so the question is like, uh, do I fire up uh, attribute rules if I do an attribute edit versus a geometry update? Okay. So, first, we don't support geometry updates. I don't think you can add an attribute rules on the shape field. I don't think you can do that. But but we indirect directly support using your intersector so certain yeah. geometry operations. You can detect the sh shape changes yeah, you, or certain things. You can read and detect shapes changes, but this currently is not available because two things. First, we don't have the pre-edit state currently. This is something that we're gonna ship in the next release, where we now I have edited the geometry, but the dollar sign feature that we talked about here actually just give you the latest state of the feature. So if you, for example, uh, let's say this is a polygon, it's a thousand meter square. You shrink it back to uh, I don't know one meter square. The input dollar sign feature dot shape will be the meter square, not the thousand, right? So what are we gonna do to compare different feature state? Is like we're gonna prov provide you with the old state. Okay. The other thing is to edit other features, you really need the DML functionality that we talked about, right? So if you you cannot really update other features but yourself essentially, right? Yeah, so for the other one, just really, so is there any scope to actually, or is there any tools or scripts that are available now to assist in migrating the rules from attribute assistance tables to this? I don't believe there are, but we, we worked with the solution team and basically 99% of the attribute rules that, uh, at the attribute assistant rule, you can do them today with attribute rules. Yeah. Okay, so. Hey, no, no, don't worry about it, so yeah. How is Data Reviewer fitting into this? So Data Reviewer team is working really hard to uh, basically migrate the Data Reviewer rules into the attribute rule system, right? So they are uh, kind of in, in the engine of the attribute, Data Reviewer will be using attribute rules behind the scenes, right? So you still need obviously Data Reviewer, right? Like if you can, if you if you got this product, you can you want to use all these uh, cool uh, basically uh, rules to in, in your system, right? Cool. And that all you have to do is like all what you see is like you're gonna see these attribute rules as part of the Data Reviewer, right? So so you, I think tomorrow there's a Data Reviewer session and they're gonna show you the, how they are migrating the Data Reviewer to start using leveraging this geodatabase attribute rules as well. So yeah. Okay. And as a UX level, you will see the user-defined rule as well as data reviewer rules together. But you cannot alter those data reviewer rules. 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, is it possible to create circular Repeat, repeat. Yeah, so the question is, can, is it possible to create circular uh, cyclical reference or like attribute rules firing each other indefinitely? Today, you cannot do this, right? But once we introduce the DML, where you can actually uh, run a calculation rule, and then as a result, this rule updates another feature, which that feature fires up calculation or which updates another calculation or just you can you can run into this situation. So we're working on to fixing these problems that one as a result. But today you cannot because the only thing you're calculating is yourself. So you you, know, you don't have effects on others. Actually we are talking about it nowadays. With yeah. limiting after six iteration or something we are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's, the, what's the best way to test your rules? Is it is it to strip some Python and then just use it to Check the output, or is there like a, like a way to unit test almost? These actually okay, so the question is like, uh, how can I test these things? Uh, uh, obviously, there are many ways. You can, you can write Python to immediately just test, or just create a bunch of features and delete them. The attributes will also get fired. Uh, you can use ArcGIS uh, Arc uh, SDK, Pro SDK. You can use even the apply edit, right? Just hit the apply edit uh, REST endpoint directly and just write some tests there in JavaScript. So you can do that. One okay. more adding. There is a arcade, in the resource page we have the arcade link. There is arcade playground. Right. So you can write simple script oh, and see cool. how it works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, final question and we're out of time. <laughs> okay, um, so how does it work with collector and survey one two three? <laughs> So, good question. So, collector, if you're connected to the feature servers, like online, these attribute rules will get fired, and, and the collector will report you back to error, right? Because, again, everything is firing on the server. In the future, once we support offline capability, the collector will take the data offline, right? And then offline, the, data, the rules will be a fire on the device. Today, this is not supported. So, if you take your offline data today, no rules will get executed. Okay, but if, if you go on the field offline yeah. with the rules, living in the future service, when you come back and sync it, will it work? Correct, yes, it will work. Yes. It's a good question, yeah. So yeah, the question was like, if I sync back my edit, will, that, will it fail? Yes, of course, because it's syncing, it's like I am reapplying my edits kind of to the server. So yeah, they will essentially get fired. Uh, can you repeat that, please? So if you have an error in one of your first data entry points and you're offline, can you yeah. sync back up? When it throws that error, will it wipe out the subsequent data that's created? So uh, sync as an operation is, is a kind of an edit operation, right? So what will happen is, is all, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it all goes in or none will go in because it's an atomic operation. If something fails, the whole thing will fail. If, yeah, so. We have to think about that recovery, but um, I need to get back to you about this and yeah, ask yeah. our sync. I want to double check. Yeah, feature yeah. That's a good question, though. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. All right, guys, uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Catch up. Yeah.